To talk about this, uh, we have invited three amazing speakers. First uh, one will be Christophe. Uh, he was on stage yesterday to give us all an overview of Transmodal, Netflix and Siri. Uh, format uh, exchange for data. And this one it will be more focused on Siri because this is the real-time information. He has been one of the pioneers of travel information in France since he started working in the area in the early 2000s and way before. Um, and he is today the leader of the SEN group working on NetEx and having the actually hard just task to make a lot of state members agree on the definition of what is uh, a good passenger information. We will then hear from uh, Joshua, who is the Transit Technology Program Manager at the MBTA in Boston. And he has helped shape quality improvement to the agency GTFS feed, including the creation and adoption at various, of various extensions to the specification. His team is also responsible for publishing in-house and vendor-produced real-time data via public-facing channel. Then we will hear from Lionel, who also joined us from France, Paris. He is the co-founder and CTO of Zenbus. He is a graduate from the Ecole Polytechnique. And before obsessing over algorithm and data structure at Zenbus, he used to be an IS architect at Altron, and he still spending most of his time coding after 15 years. And that is actually true. Whenever you go to Zenbus office, you will always find him behind the screen most of the time or helping other people code. And if not, because procrastination is important in our line of duty, he reads a lot of scientific literature. So Christophe, please. So thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm Christophe Duquesne. So y yesterday I already gave an overview of what we have in Europe for uh, exchanging information. Uh, and so I'm going to focus a little more today on, on the real-time part, which is named Siri. Uh, just if you didn't see the, 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 the presentation from yesterday, as a small reminder, we have a generic data model, which name is Transmodel, which is giving all the, uh, all the words, the definitions of the world, so the concepts, their names, their definitions, and the relations between the, the, the concepts, but that's just a data model, but that's very important, covering all the public transport. And from that model, we derivate exchange protocols. Well, one is NetEx for the schedule information. Siri is for real time, so that will be the focus for today, and, and Oprah for what happened on the on, on network. But it's very important for us that everything is coming from Transmodel. That means that when we talk about a stop, or when we talk about a line, when we talk about a passing time, they all share the exact same definition coming from Transmodel. There is no difference, so you can e very easily jump from one format to, to the other. And uh, j just for you to see how, how this relates to GTFS and GTFS series, which is more what, what it's about uh, the, these two days. Uh, so GTFS can be seen as a subset of NetEx. Well, when I say a subset, it's mainly because GTFS is really focusing on passenger information and journey planning, for feeding journey planner, where in NetEx we also have a lot of operational info information, uh, like run times, uh, like uh, uh, timing points. So a lot of things which are needed at the scheduling system le 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 level uh, at, uh, for, for AVMS, but not yet for passenger information. So uh, that's why it's, 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 it's bigger. Of course, we do also have all the passenger information. And that's the same thing for Siri, uh, we'll go, go, go also a, a little more on the details. One big difference between GTFS, RT, uh, and Siri is that Siri can be used fully standalone. It doesn't require the, the full definition of the schedule information. So it can give you the name of the stop, it can give, give, give you the name of the lines, and, and so on. So all, all, all the things you don't have in, in GTFS, RT, where uh, GTFS is referring the, the, the schedule information. Um, okay. Uh, one thing which is important for us also is to clearly define the data category we are co covering. Um, oh, when you say real-time information, it's not one single information there. It's a lot of different categories of information, and it's important to keep them um, in, in mind. Of so, of course, you have all the estimated and actual. 
passing times. So that's usually the main expectation. But but that's only one of them. You also need the vehicle position, which is something a, a little bit uh, dif different. Um, you also have all the message which are exchanged through the network so that you can have on your that will be sent to the displays on the on the field or that could could be sent to your apps uh, when you use the, the systems. Um, you all, we also have something which is very important for us, which is all the status of equipments. Uh, meaning, t t typically, if you were, that would be for passways uh, in, in, in JTFS, but we, if, if you need to use a lift, for example, or a specific door, if, if the lift is not working, you need to know the status of, the, uh, of that lift and you need to know when it will be repaired if it's not wor working. So we, we have a, a service dedicated for, for, for this. And it has recently also been extended to be able to count information. So to count whatever you want, but it could be, we typically use it to count available spaces on, on, on the bike sharing station. So where you can put back your, your, your bike or available bikes on the same, same as, as station. But, but that could be any, any, any things. That could be the number of available uh, uh, lockers or the num number of available uh, audio guides if it's an uh, audio guide. So that's really being able to count the available device or available any, anything uh, on the place. We do have a very detailed system to describe uh, uh, events and incidents. We call them situations, uh, and, and it's very uh, structure. Uh, of course, occupancy, especially these days with COVID, is very important, and that has been very highly enhanced in the latest uh, release of of, uh, of, of Siri. Um, uh, we have connection status. Uh, we do have not much in France, but a lot in Germany, Switzerland, and so on. A connection protection, so where you there's a connection which is expected, and th this connection is monitored, and there's a way so you can tell people uh, that it's you you're going to lose you, the connection, is, you're not going to be able to make it, and so you you need to find an, another way to to to. to go on on your trip, but also that will be, that may be up to the authority or the operator to give you an alternative way to, to, to finalize your, your, your trip. Uh, availability of, of parking place, so uh, I already talked about it, and control actions, that, that's really being able to describe the internal control actions inside the network. So control actions could be, uh, for example, a driver change uh, or, or a respacing of vehicles, something which, is, which may not be of interest for passenger information, but which is highly important in the network operating. Um, when we talk about real time, um, it's, we need to define exactly what it is. So real time for Siri is whatever happened in one single operational day. Uh, so NetX, the schedule information is for several days with calendars and so on, so series really for one single operational day. And it gives you a different kind of point of view. You can, so Siri is a set of services, it's not one single uh, feed like, like you would, would have with JTFS reality. It's an API with se several services. And one service has, is line centric, so you request all the information for a line or for all the lines, so you, but the main filter is the line. But you also can request the information for one or several stops, so just get the passing time on a specific stop or on a specific set of, of stop. You can have also vehicle view, uh, which is very different from the live view, since a vehicle can be used uh, first for one specific line, but then jump to another line and, and, and so on. So that's really following that vehicle in all the work it's doing, it's doing in, in one single day. As I was saying, there is a connection view, so you're just going to monitor or get the information for one or a set of, of, of connections. Uh, we have the service, so the event, the event info information. So in the event, we really have a really detailed information where you can obviously use this information to update your journey planning, so calculate alternative uh, uh, paths using the, this, these events. And, and equipment service views, I, I, I already talk, talked about it, and uh, the operational view, which is also different. Uh, to access the service uh, in Siri, you can have direct requests, so you just make a request with the API and get the answer immediately, but you also can go for subscription. So it can be a global subscription, just subscribe to all the line of the network, but it could be also a limited one just to the stops you're interested in. So, so you can really use it 
either for inter-system exchange, either for uh, the direct end-user uh, uh, information. The protocol we are using is mainly uh, XML, or, or it can be SOP, it's not mandatory, but, but typically in France, for example, it's only SOP, uh, so an XML implementation. But REST is also uh, po possible, and typically in open data, it's very often that people are offering a REST interface, and, the, and then the, the answer is very often not in XML, but is in, in, in JSON. So that, that's also possible with, uh, with, with Siri. And we more recently have uh, heavy use of message brokers. So typically, if you look, for example, at what's happening in the Netherlands, they provide a Siri feeds, and they provide every single change in any network in Netherlands for the whole country. And this is based on the subscription mechanism of Siri and used through a message broker. And that's probably going to be uh, the case more and more uh, over, over Europe. Um, and, and of course, I said before, it's fully harmonized with NetX, so with, with the, the scale of information, but that's not something which is monetary. You can use Siri without the, the, the scale of information if, if you don't have, have them. Um, one thing I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, and, and that's clearly also related to, to data quality, is profiles. As you've seen for Siri, but that's also true for NetX, it's quite wide. The, the use cases you can have for, for such protocols is, is very large. And most often, people are not going to use every single feature from uh, NetX or from uh, Siri. They will define profiles saying, the, I, I'm going to use this and this and this. So, so just pick up what they need. But all, also, these standards have been defined at European level. So, there may be different way of operating networks, and I, here discussing with people, I see that in, in, in North America, the way networks are operated is quite different from, from what's happening in, 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 in France and in, in Europe, uh, and that gives us that this has impacts on, on data. So, uh, in profiles, you are going to define exactly what and the way you you are going to exchange information. For example, the the, the way you can't. The, the stops uh, in Germany is not the same way we do count the stops in France. So that's two different, but that, that, that's their the culture. You can't really change this. So if, when we were in France, obviously we say we, ha we are using the French way of counting stops and not the, 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 the German one. And we also can have uh, some additional rules. Uh, one one of, of, of the, the discussion yesterday was about identifiers. Uh, some countries like UK have NAPTANs where they, they do have a national database. So obviously any Siri feed in, in uh, UK is going to be using NAPTAN and it's going to be mandatory. So the, the, the profile is going to add some additional rules to confirm some local choices or lo local uh, legislation. So this profile are going to define a subset of the implementation, it will improve interoperability by giving additional rules, additional best practice, uh, and the best practice are, are also uh, in, in, in important, and will focus uh, on some usually specific, uh, specific need, needs. Um, so from, from this, what I wanted to say too is that we have defined, and we're on, on our way of finalizing a specific profiles for inform passenger information in Europe. So obviously it's for passenger information. So the scope is, will, is going to be quite close to the G GTFS RT uh, scope. So that's a way to have a profile for one single specific use case. And we will work very soon with, with uh, mobility data to have a mapping between this European profile uh, so EPIP RT. So we have two 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 main profiles. One for NetX, which is which name is EPIP, and and one for uh, real time, which name so for Siri, which name is EPIP RT. So that's similar as GTFS RT, and we will have a mapping, a formal mapping that we will do together with mobility data to go from one to the other. Uh, so to to easily use both Siri, uh, EPIP RT, and and and, and uh, GTFS RT, and then. That's one of the important things for the future, still trying to keep the work done here uh, from mobility data and more, more for, from, from, from the, the North American side as consistent as possible with what we're doing uh, in, in Europe. Um, about quality, at Data4PT, we are developing tools 
to check the quality of that active feeds. So the, the, the first tool we have built is available now. I, I will be back on it. It's, but it's, it's for uh, uh, scheduled information, so ma mainly for, for NetX. But we are going to do exactly the same thing for Siri and with the same kind of, of principle. Uh, it's kind of a three-stage three validation. Uh, so you get a data, a data feed. For the first thing you, you do is validate against the XSD. So validate that the X, when it's XML, validate that it's conformant to the definition of X, XML you want. And the fact that we are using uh, uh, XML allows us to have a lot of internal rules inside the XSD. So there are a lot of constraints that are already checking that, that the things are done the, the, the proper way. Then the second validation level is, will be to validate against the profile. So the profile is giving additional rules and the, 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 the checking mechanism is going to, to, to validate against that profile. So if it's, I was giving the example of, of using Naptan's IDs, so that, then you're the, in, in UK they will check that any ID they get for a stop is really coming from, from Naptan. Uh, so, so that will be profile confirmance. And the third uh, thing will be to, to, to check the consistency of, of information. So typically one thing we, were, we have talked a lot about is Make, making sure you don't have a bus running at 200 kilometers uh, per, per, per hour, uh, but, but there are a lot of consistency you, you can do uh, that you stay in, in the proper geographic area um, and then uh, there's no too, too, too long wait times and, 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 and so on. So this is the process. Uh, still connecting with, with another, another topic from yesterday is, is everything is done here open source, meaning that you can use the validation tool online, so it will be available for any uh, op operator providing data, but also any consumer who wants to check before using it that, that the, the, the data is, is, is okay. Uh, so they will be able to submit it to uh, the, the uh, website on, on, online via, via an API or, or via file drop-off. And, uh, but also, since it's open source, you can uh, obviously download the, the, the source. You can check here, it's on GitHub. And do your own installation, do your own customization, add your own specific rules if, if you have some. Um, so that, that's, that, that, that's a really important, that's not doing everything, of course, but that's an important first step for, 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 uh, for data quality. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe. And taking us to the other side of the Atlantic, Joshua for MBTA. Thanks, everybody. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, just very quick, uh, my name is uh, uh, Joshua Favian from the Customer Technology uh, Department. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work that we've done around uh, crowding, uh, specifically in the last couple of years. Um, but uh, I also do uh, all sorts of uh, other work in the, in the GTFS sphere uh, and around all of our sort of uh, public-facing and increasingly uh, internal-facing data that we have. Um, I think many of you were at uh, Logan Nash's uh, wonderful presentation yesterday about Skate. Uh, so I won't go too on about uh, the things that we do uh, in, in our department uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, but uh, just the screen here gives a little bit of the overview. We, ha uh, we maintain our public-facing website. Uh, we maintain a lot of uh, signage in our stations and increasingly even standalone bus stops, um, as well as internal uh, applications like, like Skate that was presented about yesterday. Um, but but per per perhaps just as importantly, our department, uh, we. You know, we put together all of the data that 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 publish, or sorry, that that gets represented in, in all of these applications. Um, so we publish the data. You know, we aggregate it, uh, and we you know we we make sure that it, it adheres to a, as high quality standard as, as possible. Uh, yeah. So uh, back back in early uh, 2020, uh, in e, I believe it was in June June or July 2020, um, just a few months in, uh, into the uh, into the pandemic, uh, we we were the first uh, tra public transit agency uh, in, in sorry the largest public transit agency in North America uh, to publish uh, real time information around crowding on on our buses. Um, so these are a, a few of the places uh, where you can see it uh, currently live. Um, signs and on, on our website, and you know, just just looking back at it, it, it still really amazes us just how quickly we were able to put this together. Um, so you know, 
crowding information, you know, let's say start of 2020 was, you know, yes, uh, we want to get to this at some point. Uh, but then, you know, as soon as uh, March hit, you know, we, we kind of, you know, it, it took us a few weeks, but we kind of started realizing, well, wait a minute, this is actually something very important to our customers all, all of a sudden. Uh, you know, this is now an issue of, of safety, really. Um, so just a few months, or sorry, just a few weeks uh, into sort of the initial lockdowns, uh, we began brainstorming, you know, what sort of things could we do on a very quick basis around crowding? And uh, you see here, um, we're, you know, we're, we're coming on um, about, about two years now where we started putting out data for, for bus. Um, but you know, as as we got, you know, we started getting very excited, and you know, we have we have folks in our department, uh, uh, we have uh, visual designers, uh, we have software engineers, and you know, everyone, you know, very eager uh, to to put this together. But you know, we did have to kind of uh, put the brakes uh, very quickly and say, you know, are, are we putting, you know, are we solving the right problem in the best way that we possibly can? You know, is this a problem that our writers actually care about? And the solutions that we could put together very quickly are those solutions that are actually going to be helpful and meet the needs of, of, of these customers, right? And so, you know, as we started, you know, kind of mocking up potential designs, we also had our in-house researchers uh, put together a, a survey um, that we sort of disseminated out to writers through various means. So yes, Twitter, of course, but uh, not everyone is on Twitter, obviously. So we put uh, advertisements on screens and stations. Uh, we even reached out um, to some of our partner internal departments um, to reach out to the accessibility community around Boston. We also made connections with uh, uh, local labor unions who uh, were more likely to have uh, workers that were still using a public transport um, during these early months of the pandemic. And so uh, we had an online survey, but we also kind of followed up with many of the respondents with phone interviews. And you know, if, if any of you have any sort of experience in the, the, the user experience uh, world, particularly with transit, uh, you would realize very quickly that um, this is like a you know, very, very difficult challenge of, of sort of testing with users uh, when we can't really uh, safely work with them in, in person any, in, any longer. And so uh, this, is, this is a little bit of a, a summary of, of, of who we heard from. We had about 1,000 respondents um, to, to our survey across you know, people taking both uh, bus and, and subway modes. Um, I could pull all sorts of uh, quotes from the, the interview notes and, and so on, but here, here, here are just a couple of here. Um, I don't have a car, and I have to take three buses uh, to, to get to the hospital where, where I work. Um, I, I'm at risk every single day. Right, so we, you know, on, on one side, you know, we have, we had a lot of, and obviously still do, uh, had, a, had a lot of writers who taking alternate routes, to take, you know, taking a car, a car share or, or cycling was just not possible for their commutes. And, and additionally, you know, they couldn't just delay their trip by two hours um, to get to work if two hours from now the buses might be less crowded, um, you know, showing up to work uh, late is not necessarily an option. And we also had you know, plenty of writers, I'll, I'll read this quote here, uh, that bus is crowded and, and I will wait for it if it comes in less than 10 to 15 minutes, right? So uh, we, we definitely learned from a lot of folks that yes, the crowding information could be useful, could be important, but it's, it's only one piece of, of sort of the mental calculus uh, that these writers, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of us, myself included, are, are making when determining do I get on this bus or not? Um, you know, the real time sort of the time arrival predictions that uh, at least MBTA we've been uh, providing for many years, that's still a very big piece of that puzzle. And so, you know, we, we, we determined that um, writers kind of want as much information as possible, right? So they, they, they want the real time information of is this next bus going to be crowded or not? But um, many writers also wanted sort of uh, historical, sort of uh, more trend based information. You know, um, on Tuesdays in the afternoon, is it likely to be crowded? Or, you know, even for people who weren't writing at the time and might potentially be considering going back to the office, this, you know, this was later in 2020 and even to this day, um, is, you know, when, when, when should I ride? 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m.? I don't know, right? Um, but then, you know, getting into sort of the, the technological aspect, and especially early in 2020, sort of the limitations for us was what sort of hardware did we already have at our disposal? 
what sort of data were we able to, e did we either already have or were able to very quickly hack together um, to get this information out in a high quality manner. And so for our different modes, um, you see here we were kind of able to provide certain types of data or, or, or not provide certain types of data. And so focusing on bus for a little bit because that, that's really where we, we were able to make the real-time um, crowding information available. Uh, the majority of our buses at the time, uh, I want to say is around 70% uh, had um, APC technology already installed. It, it was uh, the laser beam, uh, of, it was that variety of, of, of automated passenger counters. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's, you know, you go, you, as you walk through the doorway of the vehicle, uh, there are a couple of, of, uh, of sensors and there's sort of the invisible laser beams. You break the beams, that tells us that you've either entered or exited the vehicle. And as we, as, as our, you know, our, our engineers were able to, to figure out, uh, for our particular APC vendor, we, we were actually already uh, sort of getting the, the data already in, in real time. It was getting put into the, the database for our, our AVL provider. Um, but we, we just weren't doing anything with it in real time, right? Our, our service planning groups were sort of using it in aggregate to kind of, uh, you know, to, to determine, you know, three months later how many riders uh, we're, we're using the service, but we weren't using it in real time. And so our engineers were able to sort of um, manipulate the data a bit, sort of figure out sort of edge cases around, you know, how do we clean up the data when the bus gets to the end of the line? Or, you know, let's say, what if the route does us an odd thing at the end where passengers can actually stay on the bus, that sort of thing. So there were a lot of cases that we, we, had, we had to deal with, but, um, you know, we were able to uh, come up with a solution that um, after plenty of validation, uh, was able to meet our, our standards for publishing real time, um, you know, to, to to the customers. And so when I say validation, uh, this is actually what what it looked like for us. Uh, we actually were able to work with our security department and get access to our, our security camera feeds, and we had uh, basically a whole team of folks. I, I did this a few times myself, where. Um, because you know, for us, this was very un uncharted um, uh, waters, right? We we wanted to make sure that that when we put out a label to riders, that that of the level of crowdedness it was accurate. So we actually did counts. We physically counted uh, the number of people on, on the bus, and we did this uh, about 400 times in total, uh, multiple times per route, and to basically, you know, we did it on a on a route by route basis. That that's how we rolled this out. Um, we started with the routes that uh, we had some preliminary insight as to, the, you know, had the most uh, crowded conditions, and 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 then we worked on the less crowded routes from there. Um, and so, and so th th this slide here kind of uh, starts to sort of get into um, the, the weeds a little bit into how we we actually translated this in, into the feed itself. Um, so, you know, we, we had obviously the, the real-time uh, uh, occupancy field, um, but we, we found that it didn't really make the most sense uh, for sort of communicating riders what, what we wanted them to understand during the pandemic. So, yes, we could tell them, yeah, there are many seats available, uh, sure. So the, the, this here shows the, the various um, uh, values you could put for this field, but many seats available doesn't necessarily tell someone uh, whether they're able to, uh, you know, safely stay two meters apart from from you know their their nearest neighbor, right? Whether they're able to distance, uh, you know, what 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 the environment feels like to them. So we went back to, um, we, you know, we 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 went we went back to our riders, uh, sur surveyed a number of them that we had uh, responded to the initial survey and s sort of asked them a lot of these questions. And so this is what we ended up here. Uh, I, I think this, this uh, where it says not crowded actually should be outlined in green, but uh, so apologies for this, but um, this is what we ended up with, the, the language. And yes, it translates to the existing uh, occupancies values, but this is what we showed to um, our writers and we actually worked with a couple of our, our, our partner um, uh, uh, data consumers, including Transit App, to make sure that they all matched the same language. Um, and so some of the things that we, you know, we considered as part of this is, you know, how, how, to, how to kind of word this. We added colors uh, so pe people could at a glance, um, you know, see the, you know, see green, you know, orange, red, you know, a traffic signal essentially. Uh, but we also had the, the little icons here of one, two or three people just so people could see very quickly at, at a glance 
uh, very easy to understand. Uh, you know, especially for those who are either uh, colorblind and may not be able to follow the colors easily, or for those who uh, m may, may not be as proficient uh, with English as, as, as other folks. And so this is, a, this is a bit of how it looks like, and uh, I think this next slide may show it a little better. Yeah, so here we go. So you can see on the right, um, you know, it's, it's just the icons and the colors. So from, from there, we wanted to make sure it was very obvious to folks. So. Um, yeah, this, this is what we were able to put uh, together in re really just about three months. And so, um, yeah, this, this is what we did here. I'll go very quickly just in the last couple minutes that I have, um, just to go a little bit into some, some of our other modes. Uh, we we're not able to provide real-time data for, um, but we did uh, sort of go uh, into a, a bit of a rabbit hole with, uh, with our subway and we put together a Tableau-based dashboard uh, to kind of show the trends. So you, 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 would, you would be able to select your line, your time of day, um, day of week, and, and you know, see whether or not you should expect some crowding and at what stations along the line you could expect that. Um, that was definitely more, more of a challenge and you know, we, we were able to make use of a, um, uh, essentially like a, 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 a network flow a model that had already existed before the pandemic, and essentially we were able to plug in um, not a PC because that's not something unfortunately we, we don't have available for Subway at this point. But we were able to put in um, the the fair gate uh, validations. So when people are entering uh, the stations, we are able to put in that data and sort of uh, you know do, do a little bit of uh, rough regression to sort of get some some estimates and. Um, you know, not as accurate for sure as, as APC, so not quite as happy with um, the, the result at the time, but uh, we, were, we were able to, um, to put out this, this dashboard. Um, here's a bit about what, what went into this. Uh, I'll, skip, I'll skip this for the, for the sake of time, but um, it's, it's, actually, um, it's actually a bit interesting because we actually ended up uh, re retiring the dashboard. Um, partly because of uh, not, a, not a large uh, amount of, of folks that we saw were actually using um, the dashboard. And you know, I, I think you know, looking back at it, there's, there's questions. Certainly, you know, um, was this the right approach? Uh, you know, should we have sort of gone down a different road of putting this into our, our public GTFS feeds? Um, you know, but you know, sort of, there's sort of like the, the chicken and egg question is to you know, sort of uh, the clients uh, or our consumers, you know, using this data um, if, if it was in that feed. So um, then the next thing that we are sort of working on for our subways is there are a number of brand new vehicles. Uh, for most of our subway lines, we are replacing uh, the fleets. Uh, for two of the lines, we're replacing 100% of the fleets. They all have automated passenger counters um, on them, which um, sounds great. And you may be thinking, oh, great, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to have this uh, information on the screens very soon. but um, that is still something we are working out with the manufacturers in, in terms of how to, um, how to get the data um, out of this. And you know, I, I think for other agencies uh, you know, who may be hearing this, I think um, definitely some valuable lessons to sort of be learned in terms of you know, having your technological folks sort of uh, be very closely in, in touch with your sort of your, your uh, uh, vehicle uh, procurement um, teams. And so you know, because a lot of, a lot of this happens very many years in advance. And so we're, we're trying to pay, uh, play catch up. And, and then finally, um, just very quickly, uh, you know, we also launched some information. This was actually late in 2021 uh, around commuter rail. So our, our suburban rail system, uh, we show the seat availability in the, um, in the timetable. So this is sort of the interactive part of the mbta.com website. And you're able to um, get sort of a, again, this is historical information, not real time, but you're able to see for your train, um, is it typically crowded or, or, or not? And so this information is updated on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and, and so, you know, just, just to kind of wrap this up here, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, one of the sort of the advantages that, you know, that we have had, and especially with the bus crowding uh, uh, project, is that, you know, we, we did have an in-house team, so that, that definitely did work to our advantage, I, I, I will say that. Um, you know, we had a lot of the information kind of in pieces, but in sort of disparate places, so, it, you know, it was a matter of getting, uh, putting a lot of these teams, to, um, existing teams within customer technology, right? So all the folks that, that you see on the screen here, uh, 
before April 2020, we're all working on separate teams, and so it was a lot of sort of uh, sort of collecting people, uh, you know, saying like, okay, you know, this is now the highest priority um, compared to everything else on, on our roadmap, and so you know, kind of putting together this, these sort of uh, flash teams, so to speak, um, to to really serve our our emergent needs for for our writers. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Joshua. And now we will hear from Lionel when the solution that Zenbus can actually give when, unfortunately, a lot of agencies don't have what you have at MBTA, which is actually a team. <laughs> yes. Hi. Thanks for being there. So. Um, I'll aim to be quite brief and just a little bit controversial uh, in the, the aims of sparking an interesting conversation later. Um, so, yeah, let's jump in. Um, I, I would like you, everyone here, to think about the counterfactual uh, thought experiment. Let's say, let's imagine a world where the default is having real-time data that is ubiquitous and high quality, like really everywhere, everywhere. And so what would change, really? And a sub, an interesting sub-question is, when the data is not available, what does that mean in that counterfactual world? So before jumping into the weeds, um, I'm not going to repeat what was eloquently said by other speakers just before me and uh, earlier this morning and yesterday. We're all convinced that uh, real-time data is very important for the passengers and for ridership. And um, I'm still looking out for really good scientific studies on the, on the subject and the, the causality of it, but um, I think we can take some weak version of it as granted here. So I'll present other arguments for um, our own ecosystem while we why we should focus on real-time data uh, first. So, another aside, I do like digressions. Um, so, data, and in particular real-time data, still wants to be free, kind of. Um, so, um, I won't show a lot of uh, won't show a lot of screens uh, from our back office, but uh, and. I took the cowardly way out of not messing around with super admin mode um, live uh, during the session, but maybe we can try that later. So I'll be showing examples from one city in France where we do produce the GTFS RTF that is on the public uh, portal, for, uh, the governmental portal uh, for all the open data. And uh, I know by default that I'm, I can show you that information because it's under uh, a compatible license. And the data that we have in our back office is exactly, technically, the same data that we do show in the GTFS RT feed and various other feeds and web apps and apps. So let's try this. So yeah. Uh, I don't, so I was half joking about that, about wanting to be free, but it wants to be shared, and I mean that in the technical sense. Speaking as a software engineer, and I know there are others here, um, it is efficient and elegant, uh, and it makes our days brighter when we find a good solution for a complex problem, and it does make sense when you produce real-time feeds to have specific data structures that do not come after, like downstream from a database that are optimized for real-time access and various modes of publication. And I'm, so my mad presentation skills are, uh, well, are what they are, but what just happened here was not a zoom, it's actually a screen grab of our own public web app showing exactly the same thing at the same time, and it's no surprise because it's actually pulling the very same data structures uh, in our own dedicated cache, distributed cache system. So um, it's, it should be uh, 
not the actual implementation, but this kind of approach, I feel, should be a good default for people that are both producing and consuming real-time data. And so the reason why is that data needs to be trustworthy. Uh, and I mean that, of course, for the passengers, they do really need to, to be able to trust like the system and what is displayed and the information. But uh, every vendor, authority, operator needs, actually, <laughs> it's very critical that they may be able to trust the data. And I would like to make the argument that although ETAs and predictions are very important and uh, a lot of people feel that they are the core of uh, what is important in the real-time feeds, um, I kind of disagree. Uh, it's very important to have ETAs and to make them as accurate as possible, um, but um, there are lots of complex interactions there and uh, uh, for instance, what you really don't want to happen is uh, for someone to miss their bus because the bus departed a bit early and you don't want to give the impression that the bus is going to be on time when it's going to be one minute early. So actually you want to skew your ETAs, in some use cases, towards lying to the user and making them believe the bus is a bit early. And this decision is is not a decision that the producer should make. The producer should be transparent about how the sausage is made and let the consumer, the ultimate consumer, make this decision. So I would argue that uh, what is really important about real-time data is the, the past and the not-so-distant past. So like, the smaller the latency, the better, and the more um, the more you can describe what has happened in sufficient detail, unambiguously, the better. So, of course, this is in a perfect world and uh, we're not in a perfect world. So this is the same screen grab uh, with all the lines in the, the, the middle-sized network uh, that I took as an example. And not, not going too far into the description, on the left we have like a feed of alerts and the, the most interesting ones are, are the top, and these are trips that, at that moment, we don't consider to be happening, but they should be happening. So, yeah, that's bad. And so, was the trip canceled? What happened? Okay, uh, switching to something not dissimilar to vehicle monitoring, that is the point of view of a vehicle, so zooming in, so to speak, I'm sorry for the corny animations. I, I, we, we see so very, very detailed data about what this vehicle was doing at that exact time. Well, a bit later, so. And we do have an explanation. So uh, among the ma many things that are not quite okay, uh, on the right you see that uh, there is the, the planned route, so GTFS speaks the shape, and we see that almost a, from the beginning of the trip, there is a detour. So, yeah, it's pretty hard to guess what is happening, but it's definitely not what is supposed to be happening. And quite a lot of stops are being skipped there. So, people that trust the schedule are waiting for nothing, or maybe there was some information available, but it wasn't made available to us, and we have to make a snap decision about what we're showing. Uh, but there are deeper reasons, so uh, there is uh, on the bottom, but not um, almost on the, the bottom, there's a latency graph. And we see that actually, well, it's a bit hard to read, but the, the, um, the gist of it is that we have connectivity issues, so the positions are still sampled, but they're not being sent to us. And then at some later point, well, the whole package is sent to us, then, and so th there is a pattern there. Maybe it's a hardware issue, maybe something other related to the detour, maybe we don't really know, but we have to make do with it. And, um, and lastly, there is a, a weird pattern happening a bit later, and that's clearly an implementation issue with uh, positions, older positions being sent over and over again. Uh, but it doesn't impact the, the latency per se because it's still collecting and sending like recent positions. So 
I <coughs> very masterfully blurred um, some identifying information, but this data comes from a third party supplier. Uh, and this doesn't happen uh, when data comes from our own Android app, but uh, for other reasons, it's, uh, we can't do, deploy that everywhere, and actually we shouldn't. So um, this is a good moment uh, to say that we're both a producer and consumer of, of data. Consumer in the sense that uh, a lot of devices connect to our API directly, and uh, also that, of course, we depend on the scheduling information from the PTA or the PTO. Although, just like everyone else earlier this morning, uh, we do like stuff to data to bring it up to speed. But that's like our collective problem. So, I don't want to elaborate on all the reasons uh, that something can go wrong, but um, I feel that it's very important for real-time systems and producers and consumers of data to to be able to describe in the most consistent way what is happening, even if what is happening is something we have no clue about. So, I would say, and this is the kind of sort of controversial part, that um, putting real-time data first, conversely, uh, means that the scheduling information might be seen as actually a byproduct or like not so preconditioned, but yes, uh, something that comes after in the sense that what we want to do is make sense of the real-time data, and it's very useful to be able to predict it, and actually scheduling information is a pretty good predictor of what is going to happen, but it's not perfect. Uh, so in, in machine learning speak, it's a, it's a good prior, it's a strong prior, but uh, it's not a perfect one. Um, and yeah, as a joke, of course, that in some sense the scheduling is causing things to happen. So, of course, it's quite easy to predict something when you make it happen. So, now, just to to loop things back back to the first counterfactual, uh, what I meant by by the perfect world that we don't live in. Uh, there's an obvious thing that if Going back to to the scheduling information, if the prediction is perfect, we don't need real-time data. But yeah, that's obvious. So this counterfactual is more interesting um, because I would like us to collectively uh, move towards that goal. Uh, nowadays, as I just showed it, and I'm sure we're not the only ones experiencing this problem, the abs absence of data is usually a symptom of some hardware issue or not being like notified in advance of a detour or a scheduling change. But what we would like to do is move towards a world where the absence of data or inconsistencies in the data are very interesting information in itself. Uh, so we would love, it would simplify our algorithm, <laughs> uh, we would love to, when we have like no data, we would love to be able to tell confidently, with confidence, that the trip has been cancelled. And because we can't do that, we have to make do and solve the problem on our side, but we would love to solve it collectively. And um, so we're very keen on, when we're in consuming data, to share it in real time as it happens, uh, because we can't solve the problem. Uh, this, I'm very proud of the code we have, but we can't solve it on our own. So uh, legibility is important for the writers, but it's very important for us too. And that wraps it up. Thank you, Lionel. I'm turning to the room. Is there questions? To any of our speaker, uh, this is a question for Josh. Um, crowding, um, crowding in summer 2020 might be different than what crowding is now. How do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, so it, it it is a good question. Um, from sort of 
So in, in terms of the way we, we communicate uh, to writers, in terms of like the labels that, that we put, it, it is still very much uh, the same as we started in 2020, how we are at this point in 2022. Um, we, 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 we have adjusted, uh, I think at one or two points, sort of, um, you know, what sort of, you know, behind the hood, uh, what number of riders on a bus, and you know this this varies depending on the size of the the, the bus. We actually have a, a whole table. Um, you know, this bus has this much capacity, but uh, we have adjusted the capacity a bit, um, depending on sort of uh, at the different stages of our, of our um, of the the government sort of reopening. Um, um, yeah, so that, 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 that's really how we've sort of adjusted it. But um, when we've been sort of adding the new modes, and particularly with, um, with commuter rail, um, the, you know, um, that's more of historical information. So we, we've been thinking a little bit of uh, talking about it in terms of seat availability rather than, rather than crowding, um, kind of acknowledging that it's sort of, you know, we get sort of, as we got sort of to the late stage pandemic, that that's, that's what people are sort of looking for more and particularly with that, with that mode. So we'll actually we'll turn to the room and when preparing this panel with uh, all of the three speakers, we actually had a question for you in the room because we're in an interactive session is, what would you like to see in real time information? What would actually matter to you? Not necessarily as a representative of today your organization, but also as a writer, because all of us were actually quite interested in, we can keep on developing new tools, we can keep on creating, trying to read minds, but no, it doesn't work. Uh, though Lionel is very good at creating an alternative world where real-time data is by default perfect, so what would you like to see? What would you like GTFS real-time to become, for example, or Siri to be extended to? Uh, hi, yeah, I don't have a question or a response so much about what I would like to add, but one thing as a writer and as a researcher I would love to see is, is an estimate provided, maybe, and this would not be useful for a user necessarily, but like a standard deviation or something that gives some indication of how accurate or reliable the feed is currently. Maybe if that's something that the, the consumer produces um, is a sort of an estimate of saying, you know, oh, Times are typically this accurate on this route, and so you have a bit of a sense of whether that's, yeah, whether you, how much you can trust the, the actual data. Because the default is, if it's wrong once as a rider, your default is to just never trust it again, right? Yeah, that, that's great. Um, um, actually, yeah, we, so I, I don't think we have the, the best ETAs uh, currently in the world, but we're, having different heuristics and uh, using different like statistical data pages and doing stuff. And I would love to have a standard way to share like this data about how the sausage is made um, because it, it would relieve us from having to make, we, we can still make one decision on our own like app, web app, etc. cetera. Uh, and our goal in, in these products is to like to give the, the, the riders an extra set of eyes that can see further uh, than their physical eyes. Uh, so that's pretty specific and it's not related to journey planning, et cetera. Uh, and, but, so we tailor our standard output to that. Uh, and we would love to be able to, to say, okay, so what we're meaning by the, the ETA is this, is that uh, you're in the 90% range from what, what we know, and we know that you don't want to be a one minute late, so we're kind of skewing, skewing the distribution here a little bit. And uh, yeah, we would actually love to share that information. And, and yeah, we do, structurally, we do produce it, and I think a lot of people in the room also have it in some way. No, the, the, the point is, it's it also, may be difficult because each algorithm, each ETA, has its own way of doing and it. it's not always very well documented, it's very instrumental software, so uh, the confidence level is often not published or even often not yet really known. <laughs> um, but, but that may be something interesting, I mean, to, to add in the exchange protocol some information about the quality of the ETA and find some information that we could disseminate about them 
So, so people know what the process for collecting the information, where does it come from? Is it from, from the GPS on board? Or is it from the, the AVMS, which is calculating, and what kind of algorithm? That, that, that may be also for the, maybe not for the end user itself, but the, for, 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 for the app using the system and information that will be valuable to use and say, okay, we, we can give us some kind of confidence level, but yeah, that, that we will need additional information. Um, yeah, just just to add on to that, so it, the MBTA, at least for the the real time, uh, the arrival time predictions that we we generate in house, um, really for our subway mode, we you know we, we do have we do make our own sort of um, uh, accuracy metrics, you know that we put together, uh, and you know we have a whole dashboard to kind of you know we we can review them anytime we make changes to the the algorithms and kind of see how it's performing against that. But it is a very good point that you know we kind of. You know, when we first made that dashboard, for example, you know, we, we had to sort of come up on our own. Uh, what what are the standards? You know, looking at our agencies, you know, published uh, standards and seeing, you know, well, there's not a whole lot about sort of prediction accuracy in there. So we kind of had to made it up our, on ourselves and figure out what sort of timing bins. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think moving toward some sort of standard and that you know we could then publish to. Um, you know, sort of the, the app developers, you know, uh, sort of like a, a letter grade, for example, of this is how we think this, you know, prediction might go on. Um, I'm thinking like of an analog to, I don't, I don't remember the, the exact specification, but uh, I believe it's for, for GPS. There's a sort of, uh, when, when you get sort of a, like a raw uh, GPS read, you, you get an indication of how accurate um, that, that location it tends to be. So. Uh, and I didn't say it, but in, in Siri, we do have fields for uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, but the, but the, the fact is, it's not very often used by producers, <laughs> but, but we do have it. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, to see how can real-time uh, data could uh, improve uh, planification by itself, you know, with GTFS. We got uh, some anticipation what could be an ETA, for example. But in real life, we have detour. We have a different time of transfer. Men and at work in the city, traffic. So how could real-time data could really help the user get more uh, accurate uh, data and uh, planification by itself? That's an important point. And, and, uh, that's really for Siri one of the important use cases, uh, and, and that's also linked to the quality. Since one of the expectation is that operators are going to internally use the data they are providing for open data, meaning that they are going to reuse that GTFS RT or Siri feed internally and analyze them and see. For example, if due to the traffic every day or every Monday, whatever, a runtime is too short, then, then they will be regularly late at a specific, for a specific journey or for a specific stop. Then, then there's an expectation that the operator is going to reuse the real-time information he's producing, compare it in the scheduling system to what was planned, and when there's a systematic error, delay, or whatever, then they will correct the 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 the, the, the schedule information so it's feasible uh, and and that's very often that that they don't take into account every information but the, the, typically the traffic for 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 bus or just the traffic is evolving and with the, with the pandemic the traffic has just t totally changed and that means that that the, the schedule information is not any more possible, or or they could do better because runtime are are, are, are uh, faster now, and they, they are keeping on doing the respacing. So it's really expected that real-time feeds like GTFS RT or Siri are not only to be used for passenger information, but also internally for schedulers to, to check against what has really happy, happened on on, happened on the on the field. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add, and this, is, this is kind of uh, piling on that point a bit, uh, and I, I suspect most other transit agencies at this point are, you know, in a very similar situation uh, where sort of, you know, updating the, those running times to kind of account for uh, recent changes, um, you know, increases or decreases in traffic, you know, due to the pandemic. It's, it's, it's still a, a very 
uh, it's a very tedious process. And you know, it's, uh, I know at our agency, you know, we have uh, you know, well over 100 routes, let, let's say. Um, we, our, our service planners are only able to update, you know, maybe, uh, for, you know, let's say maybe up to a quarter or a third of, of those routes running times you know, every single three, four months. So you know, figuring out ways to sort of, you know, maybe it's like uh, being able to package all, all of this real-time information into you know, a very succinct way you know, over a long period of time to sort of um, make this process better for, and, and, and obviously this goes you know, even further into sort of the, 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 the scheduling software itself, um, you know, depending on what, you know, uh, is, your soft, is your scheduling software, you know, is that vendor able to, to move quickly to be able to use these data uh, and sort of update the software for that, I think is the other big question. Yeah, uh, I have a, like s sort of an anecdote to share about this. Um, we used to do something not dissimilar to what I heard movie it is doing in the sense of uh, ingesting like schedules and doing our own alteration and using that as a reference. And uh, not every PTA was pleased. And um, so the, the compromise, the, the compromise uh, we hit on is actually serving like the schedule as it is, or we have like a lot of back and forth, but mostly as it is. And once we do have real time information that the bus is either leaving the first stop or better yet, like en route to the first stop, once we have confirmed that, uh, then we switch to our own ETA system. So that ties into the question of how the sausage is made. But then we show ETAs that are based on, not based on the schedule, but ba based on what we know happened and what we predict will happen. And um, so, yeah, th th this is what I mean that in a lot of ways, I think that real-time data should kind of come first. And then the schedule, um, it has different values depending on whether you're upstream, downstream, what you're doing with it. And sometimes you want it to accurately describe the past, not the future, when you're running analysis. And so um, there is a value in publishing updates to what happened two months ago. And that's, that's great. We love that. We, we, we have like a whole statistical <laughs> analysis package that dedicated to kind of suggesting retroactive changes. And um, so, yeah, it's part of the solution. Um, I am Julien, I'm a French uh, consultant in new mobilities. I have a question. Um, we talk about public transit and public uh, transport. My question is more about bikes. So I would like to have information about um, how it could be possible to have information in real time about how to park um, a bike in a big station or how to take my bike in the train because these door-to-door -door services and, and needs about bike and train, or bike and bus, or bike, bike and ferries, for, for example. And in France, in Europe, and I think in North America, it could be the same, is a very, very important uh, question. We have in our app uh, the journey to, to go to the station, to go to the rail station on the kind of modest transportation, but the link between the bus or just the bike and the bus, or the bike and the train, at the moment, it's, it's, it's a problem. I, I know in NetEx you have different discussion about that in alternative modes. I don't know if it's after with GBFS or GTFS of a, or a mix. Uh, how can we address that? This uh, this question, this problem. Thank you. <laughs> On the, the, the NetEx and, and Siri part, it's, it's already a feature which is available. Uh, you can have the description of the vehicle. Say on this train there is a bike ra bike rack, so a place where you can put your your bike, and you can give the real time information using Siri, saying that you have three spaces left, so uh, you, you can put your your bike or it's full, uh, so so you can't. Uh, so we do have it in the protocol, but now that doesn't make the data. <laughs> you, you need the producer to measure. Uh, have some sensors to, to collect the information about this, and unfortunately for now, the standard is much in advance to what the producer can provide. So we, that's probably a point where we do need users. The users need to go to the operators or the authority and say, we want this information, because uh, 
In, in fact, just having the placeholders for the information the standards is kind of the easy part, <laughs> but we did it. But, but now we are waiting for the uh, provider to, to provide the information. It, it's ready for it, but so let's, let's use it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add from the, the operator's perspective, at least for us in, in Boston, uh, th this actually is, is something that, that's come up relatively recently. We, we've been getting a little bit more feedback from riders sort of wanting more sort of bike share integration you know, on our website or, or being able to plan that information. So we don't have anything yet on that, but um, it is something we want to work toward. Um, I, the question I'm, I'm kind of, this, this made me think of, and there, it may already exist, I, I, I haven't been following along, but with um, uh, Open Trip Planner, you know, I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, can that sort of accept uh, GTFS and GBF, uh, GBFS, you know, both at the same time? Uh, so, like, for example, on our um, our public-facing website, like our Trip Planner is based on on Open Trip Planner, and so, you know, that could be an easy way to sort of integrate the, these information um, together. Um, and just and just even even talking about this is this is for GTFS, but um, we do have, in general, sort of information about whether or not you know you can take the the bicycles aboard, but even then, sort of the the specification right now, it's it, it's not as as granular as we would like it to be. Um, there's sort of like the question of how real time fits into into all this. Um, uh, these are problems that I'm sure um, uh, Net uh, uh, NetX has solved you know decades ago, but um, we're still trying to figure out. In, the in theory. <laughs> No, no, yeah, uh, as a bike geek, yeah, I think like there are, it's evolving quite fast and there, there are like niche issues sometimes related to accessibility, like recumbent bikes are not like very common, but it's growing and it takes space, you need crowding information, you need to know. It's about the same set of problems that having a wheelchair and uh, so yeah, it's evolving pretty fast and so having a standard and having real-time data, it's not the end of it all. Yeah. Well, then, thank you very much to uh, our three speakers for presenting today and giving us insight on what real-time data can actually bring to the table, how to actually use the different specifications that exist, and if there is one thing that I think we should all uh, take out from this is, as Christoph said, the standard, the, the specification can always evolve and adapt and we can try and model the problem, but if the data is not produced nor consumed, then basically it's an empty shell. So with that, I would like to give it back to you, make sure that when you go home, uh, you start discussing with your team on how to actually produce or consume part of the specification that is not open yet, or that you actually express to us what you would like to see in the next future so we can bring you support for that. Once again, thank you for attending this panel, and I wish you a bon appétit for the lunchtime that will be served in the Cafcons. Thank you. <laughs>